Hello, I want to welcome everyone this afternoon to the White Gold Corporation's town hall call. Um, for your background information, um, it tra White Gold trades on the TSX Venture under the symbol WGO, and they actually they have an OTC listing, and the symbol is WHGOF. I'm David Mandy, president of O&M Partners. I also have with me Campbell McCrary and the O&M team. Uh, for you that are new to the call, these calls, just real quickly, O&M is in New York based and we're, we are, what we do is bring public companies, investors together in real time. Um, the information presented is always publicly available, but we're hoping this broadcast will really bring this information to your awareness, clarify context and help you make a, a better informed decision. Um, before we turn to our, um, our host, um, we're going to turn to Sean Ryan, who's technical advisor, who's going to talk a little bit about the Yukon and give you context for exactly where white gold is. Um, now we're going to turn to our host today, Sean Ryan, who's the chief technical advisor uh, to white gold. Um, Sean um, was responsible, uh, certainly part of the second um, gold rush in the Yukon. Um, he was featured in 2011. Um, I remember very well in New York Times, the cover of uh, profile of the Sunday Magazine section went so far as to christen Sean the king of the new Yukon gold rush. Um, the key was he has, you know, he's got many years of experience in the Yukon and his prospecting and soil work um, was uh, different. He did, he went deeper than anyone else does. And he just, he discovered some really important deposits, including um, coffee, of course, white gold, and the QV project, which adds up to seven and a half million ounces. So on that note, I'm going to let Sean tell you a little bit more about uh, what has been commonly referred to as the Ryan effect. Over to you, Sean. And Sean, share your screen so we can, sure. there you go. Yep. <clears throat> Hello, I'm uh, based out of Dawson here, or not right now, but <laughs> that's where I'm mostly working out of. But uh, the White Gold Corp was really designed uh, based on a whole pile of, like I had a bunch of different projects in 2010 and 11, to give you an idea, there was like roughly over 200,000 claims staked in the Yukon, $500 million in exploration over them two years. So there was a lot of action, but as the market <clears throat> came crashing down by 2011, most of these projects that I had optioned out to a dozen to 15 different juniors in this white gold district uh, all came back to me. So what we ended up doing was going back to the drawing board while everybody was running out of the bush. And we went back in and said, well, can we build a better mousetrap? Can we do this better? We had, uh, we did a good job doing, finding the coffee and the white and the QV, but, but we knew the technology was moving. So we actually started uh, researching various exploration methods. And so that took about three years. And we ended up working with drones to designing these new rubber track RAB drills that are working with XRFs, that are working with downhole televiewers. So coming up with new geophysical techniques. So this accumulation of, I call it now, what the ground truth team called drones to drills, we can now work in the Yukon for 30 cents on the dollar compared to 2011. So what would it cost us? $15 million in 2011? I, I would only use 5 million to come up with the same answer. So then what I did is I took all these projects and I said, look, I've got a good dozen to 15 of them. Well, there was actually over 30 projects altogether. And I said, instead of me piecemealing this out like we did on the last run, why don't we actually just package them all together and create a super company. But the intent of the super company is, is not to sit on one target and drill it off in a resource. I wanted to come up with a pure exploration company with the intent that we kiss all the frogs, all the targets, with a little bit of money, and then figure out which targets are the best out of the bunch after two or three years. So we actually came up with a business plan. And so it was a $5 million plan per year uh, to go out and evaluate the various, put three or 400,000 on different projects, do some RAB drilling, 
and then come back with a diamond drill if it was warranted. So we took that business plan to the market and uh, and we actually uh, brought it to the majors right away and uh, people like Agnico uh, jumped on board right away. So that's kind of the gist of how we started. And so the intent is, is that we have a pipeline of projects. It's not a one trick pony. And let's approach this like a major would uh, in this new, I call it the, the new white coal district. It's a district, but when is it, when does a camp become a mining camp? Is it after 10 mines? You know, so that's the whole uh, gist of this is I come from the Timmins camp and this reminds me a lot like the Timmins camp like 50 to 60 years ago. So I'll get into the start of the presentation, but that's kind of the gist of the company. I'll just a forward looking statement because I make a lot of forward looking statements, so <laughs> be cautious. So the idea is that we had to come up with uh, the land package. So that's what I came to the table with. And then I brought this to the Toronto guys, the Power One guys. And that's when we formed the company in 2016. And then we moved over and picked up some strategic partners, brought it to the majors. And the idea was uh, to come up and uh, find ore, find the majors need basically deposits, and they're coming to the end of the rope of buy-in deposits because there's not that many left out there. And our big wall of exploration uh, that has been mounting for years is nobody's looking for new things. Everybody takes an old project, <clears throat> basically moves back 100 meters and drills an old, another hole behind the old hole. So nobody's actually looking for new areas and new targets. So that's what we're trying to focus on. So. John, I'm going to interrupt you for just a sure. moment. Um, we're anticipating Q&A, and I just, for our listeners, which are now <clears throat> nearly 40 people, I think actually over 40 people um, listening in, um, we just want to make sure that as you speak, you know, if there's any questions that come up, um, we want to make sure this call answers everyone's questions. Um, so please feel free or, um, to chat in your questions. Uh, during the webinar, you can also go to the... Um, to the go to through the window pane, um, the control panel of go to webinar to ask a question or, or just email us and, and, uh, and be assured that your questions will be answered, if not live, certainly by management in a reasonable time after the call. Okay, back to you, Sean. Thank you. Okay. So here's uh, this slide four, kind of shows you what's happened in the last 10 or 12 years, like map number. From this claim map 2007 you can see there's hardly any claims in the district and a bunch of these were already mined so and here's this famous white the Klondike gold district the Klondike gold fields up in here and that's where we roughly had somewhere between 13 and 20 million ounces of placer gold with no known source ever seen it was one little discovery the, the Lone Star the Klondike gold has that they found 100 years ago but we've never seen the beast that produced the plaster. So now you can see what happened by 2019. So, but this really was the map of 2011 and the thing God just staked up like crazy. And it was mostly because we uh, made the white discovery like uh, 2008, we had 12 holes put in on that project. But to give you an idea, I had did my soils, program before that I had it since 2003 so we had a few years a head start to, to develop the target and then when they started poking holes underworld in 2008 uh, hole number 12 I think was 50 meters at three grams they came back they were actually 18 cents at the time by the end of that was the crash of 2008 2009 they came in and poked the hole behind the 50 meters of three grams <laughs> when they were 18 cents. I think they were up to 40 cents by the spring again. Well, they hit 100 meters of over three grams. And that launched the first big stake and rush. So that was a good little run. So then, then what happened was uh, Kamenak optioned the coffee project from me in 2009. So just as that discovery hole went in. And so then we did a bunch of soils, got that ready to go. 
And when they poked the hole in there in 2010, they did the discovery hole, hole number one, because it was set up right. And then the idea was <laughs> the takeover from Kinross hit right away, also underworld. Same time, attack guys found a nice new discovery in the Rao area. So that literally launched the, the Yukon into a gold fever. It was called the second gold rush. So it's the idea is that now people are starting to believe. But since then, like I say, people like Kinross and Newmont, Agnico, Victoria Gold just got their mine into production. Western Copper sitting there with the big porphyry sitting on the side close by. So, but it, it really got everybody realizing that the Yukon is like it's a urgent district. I'm hunting what I call it a tulip planter. It's a soil auger. It's three feet long. takes a two-inch plug of dirt. Timmins camp, I'd be looking for gold a 1,000 feet, but here we are on surface. So, and then the big kind of when does a district become a district or how does it become a district? The government, the Yukon and the federal government, are kicking in $360 million into road construction for resources. So we're, they're going to actually put a road from Dawson all the way to the coffee project, which is way back here. So they're actually cutting through most of our claim blocks on the way. There's roads there right now, but they're just kind of bush roads. So they're going to make them haul grade roads. And what that actually helps us out in is that the idea is that now, if I find a half a million ounce deposit sitting out there, it doesn't have to be two million, then I could feed one of the mines whether it's the heat bleach or whether it's the white, that's normal kind of crush and grind mine. So, so here's our timeline, you know, inception, <laughs> Power One and Ryan Wood joined forces out of, out of Toronto. So right away, Nico, with the business plan, they loved it and uh, they jumped in for 19.9%. Then the next spring, we decided to approach Ken Ross and because uh, we knew they were potentially shopping that project. And the idea was when Kinross bought the white, it was a really good idea. But within two months later, they actually bought the red back and Tassius project in Africa for like threw in billions of dollars into that one. So they kind of lost focus in the Yukon. So that's why we approached him, said you guys were there right away. You guys had a good idea. You're still interested, you want to own. 20% of our company that has the district and still have, if you sell us your project and still have 20% interest in a deposit. So they like that whole concept and uh, they joined forces also by May, 2017. So when we picked up the project from them, the white had, the white golden saddle had about a million ounces as a resource under their books. So since then, over the last, two field seasons, well, it's actually, it was one. It was 2018, we got to drill it for diamond drilling. And we added another half a million ounces. So we're up to about 1.5 now. And so now we have been, uh, we're gonna do another upgrade, <coughs> resource upgrade probably in Q1 of this, of next year with uh, our 2019 drill. So, but the goal is to get it well past 2 million ounces. And we're at least a year to two from that. But the idea is that our buyer is one of our partners. And it will be a, either Agnico or Kinross or both. But the idea is that, you know, uh, they're both interested in looking for, they need, you know, two to three million ounce deposits to start working. So, so here's the executive team. I'm the technical advisor, prospector, been in Dawson District for the last 27 years. Rob Carpenter was the CEO of Kamenak. It was I brought him the coffee project and he recognized the value of it right away. And then Dave D'Onofrio with the Power One team out of, uh, out of Toronto. And the idea is I call it, there's a lot of spokes in the wheel and everybody has their strengths and let's spread, let's spread that work around. So here's the, basically a pie chart of the breakup so you can see that uh, management, oh, I didn't see it, but management holds about about 22% or somewhere around there, 23%. And uh, both Ignico, uh oh, I see they changed, the, they changed the dilution down. So 
they're probably both 17.1. Like they were 19.9, but because the warrants just kicked in, I think that's what's changing the numbers here. So here's the real gist of it. So what we are is everything in yellow or orange is what we own. And really that represents 40% of all the claims in the district. But the reality is I've had the run in this part of the world for the last, like I say, 27 years. And we designed and developed this deeper soil technique. It wasn't that technically savvy. It was just, like I say, taking a tulip planter and literally everybody is taught in university to take a B horizon soil sample, which is the top six inches. This is non-glaciated terrain, which means the glacier will never hit this. Eastern Canada, parts of the states all got wiped out with glaciers some, some places, but this part of the Yukon and Alaska never got hit. So the soil profile has been weathering for millions of years. So you literally just had to go two and a half feet down through the, through the soil and, and grab a good one pound of dirt and run it to the acid. Like the other big difference here is there's less, because it's not glaciated, there's less than two to 3% outcrop exposure. So if you're an old prospector, like the turn of the century, coming up here with your rock hammer, looking around and banging on a rock and find gold, like they did in Timmins, you're out of luck here because yeah, there's there's hardly any rocks. So, and it's usually a one in a 10,000 to find in anything. So what's the probability you find in that one outcrop that's one in 10,000, that's actually in the two to 3% exposure, very nil to next to none. So soils was the method of madness. And what we ended up doing was this, what you see in this box, we literally have 400,000 soils that we've gathered over the years with the same technique, the same assay lab, everything is the same. So it's the, the most consistent soil database probably on the planet right now. So the idea is that that's what we use as a backbone to find these things. So you can see here is it's a step-by-step -step approach. And so you have your early stage projects. So that's what we go in there and do some recce soils, maybe some ground geophysics and wait for the data. And once the data comes in, then we go into a phase two, which is tighten up the soils, add a little bit more geophysics, and then, <clears throat> then basically get it ready to wrap drill. And so the rab drill versus diamond drill, I'd like to give you an idea, for remote drilling in the Yukon, diamond drilling is about 500 bucks a meter all in for the top three, like for a, per meter. RC is about 375, and rab drilling, because it's an open hole, it's around 150 bucks. So the idea is a lot cheaper to answer the question. Because really what we're just, the phase one, once you start drilling this, like in, is, is there gold there or not? And 95% of the time there's not. So why use a Cadillac to tell you the answer when you get the answer with a wrap? So that's how we've increased our budgets. So, but it's this step-by-step -step pipeline approach. And then like, just to give you guys an idea, as we, like I say, we have 400,000 soils. This represents 40% of the district, but it's actually 80% of the soil anomalies, the haystacks. That's how we find these things. So I, I've kept the best projects uh, for, for basically uh, with, for WGO. So statistically, that's what I'm getting at. If we've had, you know, the coffee's one nice deposit, the white is another nice deposit, the QV is a smaller one. So we found three in a pretty short succession. There's a, now we got 20 million ounces of plaster still out there that are out there that nobody's found the sources of these things. So there's an extremely high probability there's at least one. We won't be surprised <clears throat> there's, a, there's a high probability of two. We won't be surprised at three. And I bet you there'll be four or five of these things found as we go deeper. So that's the whole point is I'm still just hunting with the tulip planter. We barely scratched the surface here. So here's our 2019 program. It's very aggressive because we made a new discovery last year, the vertigo. So we had a $13 million budget. We drilled 17,000 meters uh, across both projects. That was this vertigo. 
and the white <laughs> to expand the deposit. We put in about 75 drill holes or rab holes, RCs. Those are our recon holes, and these were mostly focused on the white and the JP Ross project, these two projects. Here's just a kind of gives you an idea of our soil program. Like this is the early stages. So the idea is that where you see these heavier pink ones is where we've concentrated our detailed soils this year. But you could kind of see that we're hitting lots of different projects. And that's the idea. We advance these projects. We don't get too excited. Let's put some more, get some work in them, get them prepped up for next year or the year after for drilling. And I literally look at white gold as it's not designed to be taken out. It's designed to produce projects and then spin them out. But white gold should be here for the next 20 years if I, if, if I have my way here, because this is a long-term goal. So here's our golden saddle, which is basically located right in this corner of the white. And so here it is, the golden saddle. And here you can see the gold soil anomaly underneath. And this is where most of our work has been for this open pit concept here that you could see. This is a plan map looking down. But what we found is this, like we found that a few years back, this art. These are two different styles of mineralization. There's a fault in between. So golden saddle is three gram plus material, kind of quartzy veiny, silicified kind of stuff. And the arc is a graphitic and a quartzite. And it's usually lower grade, gram, like a gram and a half range. So, but, uh, but it's working out real good because we were kind of ignoring the arc over the last few years because well, we just picked up the project, but Kinross was ignoring it. Underworld poked a few holes into it, but everybody was worried metallurgically that it had graphite and had arsenic. They weren't quite sure about the met work on it, metallurgic type work, can you get the gold out? Ends up that we did some met work on it last year with Igniko, and we got about a really nice recovery of 85% with a little bit of pre-treat in the ore. So the gloves were off, and so we poked quite a few holes into the arc this year. So, but that gives you an idea. And then we'll start talking about these other targets. Here's this Golden Saddle West. And uh, here's our, some of our drilling highlights from last year. And uh, so now you could see uh, the 24, uh, basically, meters of 1.9 grams, 25 of 1. And then we had some nice hits in there this year also, or at least a few good hits, 17 of 1, a little over 1. So we're kind of getting some more. So they're actually trying to incorporate that in the pit shell design. So that's expanding the known footprint. And then we have this thing called the Ryan Surprise. And that's about two kilometers away. And you can see this nice big gold soil anomaly that was virtually ignored. And so the idea was, so here's the top of the ridge. And we started poking some holes in there last year. and. Uh, Look at the numbers here, like six meters of 20 grams, 13 meters of five. So we went back in there this year and they hit another 11 meters. Of, like we only put two holes in it. So well, one of them came out 11 meters of 2.6. And the same hole, they hit another zone deeper down of over almost 32 meters at two grams. So that's the kind of stuff that Kid or Agnico wants to see. So now, like, look, at, we're just starting to get a few holes in this target, and you can see it's a little bit deeper. So our surface signature in the soils is probably not reflecting really what's kind of going on down there. So, but we're going to put more, you know, that's what we're coming back to next year. So, and at the same time as that's going on, we ended up doing this. Here's the regional target. Here's the golden saddle. So you can see the yellow points. There's our Ryan surprise over here, Golden Saddle West, Golden Saddle itself. And now we started plugging more holes into the arc. But what you see is on the screen is all these little detailed grids that I ran over top of our known soil anomalies from last year, from actually 2011. 
that were on 50 meter spacings and we went in and tightened them up on 25 meter spacings. And then we did some ground geophysics and then we returned and we drilled where all these stars are, we drilled a bunch of rab holes. And then you put a downhole televiewer, so now you get a good structural component of it. And now we're still waiting on these data. Like that was the last of our season's work. We, we drilled, we kept all the rab drilling for the end. And the idea now is this will give us the blueprint of what our budget should look like next year to come back and diamond drill these targets. So this project, the vertigo or the VG, it's sitting across. It was one of my other projects that a company that I optioned in 2011 called Comstock. By the time they started drilling it, it was 2012. The market was basically, you know, shutting down. So he missed the big run on it. But it's virtually uh, the same. It's on the same structure as the white and gold saddle. And right now it's got a, an inferred resource of 230,000 ounces. So, but it metallurgically, it looks identical to Golden Saddle. So it's on the other side of the river. So, but the idea is that once they get a, a mill up in there going, then they could either put a winter road to cross it, or they use a barge right now on the Yukon River for another mine, the Minto mine. So they could use a barge to get to it. So, but it gives us access. And you can see that we have some other targets on it that we'll be following up on. So we're slowly consolidating the camp. That's kind of what's really going on. So then what got really everybody excited was this J.P. Ross. And the J.P. Ross vertigo is north of, uh, of the white. But <clears throat> like what, so that's what, this is a different beast. And that's what's kind of interesting. Like the Yukon's, you know, putting new things out all the time. This is an old plaster camp. And the placer gold was, this was North Henderson. Actually, Jack London's cabin was actually up here. This is the main Henderson Creek that's produced. They had a dredge on here in the 50s, produced placer gold since the turn of the century, almost 100,000 ounces. And nobody's ever seen the source. And lo and behold, when you start looking at our soils, now you can see the actual soils popping up in between these creeks. Well, it's not a rocket science to figure this out. It's just good science. So the idea is that uh, the vertigo was kind of a shocker was, now you see 30 meters of 22 grams. That was a down dip hole. But really what you're seeing is three meters of 60 grams. That's kind of getting into, that's what we've been kind of seeing these crazy high grade, you know, narrow meter to five meter sections. Here's some, uh, New drilling this year with the diamond drilling. And now you can see, well, here's four meters of nine grams and here's five meters of 11. But what you're also seeing is a half a meter of 141 grams. So that's this nature of this beast right now. So, so this is uh, what we ended up doing was we drilled about uh, 10,000 meters just on this vertigo but we poked a bunch of good rab holes on all these other targets. And so that's what's kind of, uh, so we're, we've only released 15 out of the 50 holes from the vertigo, and we haven't released any of the, these basically 30 rab holes that we actually did on a bunch of these targets. And it's kind of uh, what you're seeing, the yellow, all these yellow things, that's the actual road system. That's what's kind of unique with this one. We're actually right on the road. Like this one's a cool discovery, the X-Men. Like it's 100, 100 meters off the road. The North Frenzy is right off the road. Stage Fright is right on the road. <laughs> so that's kind of like you're always, I'm always amazed at the Yukon that, you know, I couldn't do this in the Timmins camp. So that's what it's kind of fun about this district. It's still like going back in time. So again, we're going to wait on all these holes and figure out what we're going to do with them. While that that was all going on soils doing our little magic over here and lo and behold we had a soil that was over a hundred thousand pbb gold like that was off the richter scale for their uh, their icp machine so when we called them up they said oh yeah we've been waiting for your call we ran it four times it's true like you know this is a legit hit 
So we fire it, assayed it, and it came back at 113 grams. So you knew there was a bunch of free gold in the soils. And so then we started running some of the rocks, of the visible gold in quite a few of them, running up to 426 grams. That's what happens when you get DG. So what we ended up doing there is fast tracking this. Because normally we'd sit there and get there on that project for next year. So we ended up doing detailed soils because we had a main camp sitting up here that was drilling the vertigo. So it was pretty easy for the helicopter to get over to here. So then we ran uh, ground mag BLF, the trenching or GT probing, which is just probe into the bedrock interface. Got some geology work in and we managed to drill three rab holes into it <clears throat> before the season ended. That was our last holes of the season. So again, that's the come. And uh, again, it's really close to this whole action of all this road system So and the JP Ross. So again, it's making a, and it's proven that this project, like just to give you an idea, I had since 2003 and I was looking for copper on it and uh, it kicked this gold. So that's why, you know, I knew something like, not a fluke, but it was, but serendipity has it that we were looking for copper there a few years ago, so that we were always circling that area. So that's how this business works sometimes. So then we have, I'm showing this Betty project. So this is way down to the south, right on strike with the coffee project. To give you an idea, this was everybody's favorite project. When I was shopping, the, the, when I was thinking about this model a few years ago, uh, this is what happened. Everybody wanted to buy this. This was their favorite project. And we're throwing this in because nobody talks about Betty anymore. <laughs> and the interesting part is we pulled out 50 meters of over one gram last year. And we haven't, uh, we didn't have time to get back to it this year. We were so busy with uh, all the stuff in the vertigo and the JP Ross and the white. So again, we did some more work here. We'll get back to this next year. But that's the kind of quality of the projects that we actually have in this company. So that's why I say it's a, it's not a, it's, it's a different company. It's designed to be a long-term player working side by side with the majors. And the intent is, is, you know, as my wife asked me, well, how are you making money if you're not selling your paper? The idea is that it's these spin codes every year, or if they buy it out for straight cash. So the idea is he who has paper and white gold gets Spinco paper. And if I do this right, we should do this three or four times at least in the next you know, five or six years. So it's kind of, that's the gist of this company. Yeah, I want it to go for a long term because that's what's needed in this exploration business is someone looking at the data, but with perseverance and not chasing, oh, they hit gold in Northern Quebec. So everybody runs there and, oh, and then they hit it in Northern BC. We've been focusing on the Dawson district and uh, it's basically, it pays off in the end. So this is just a little bit of the pit design, but I went through this already before. So the idea is that that's the open pit, but we have a very, very good uh, high grade, five gram plus material uh, in this. Like these were some super big intersections. Some of them were like 160 meters of a gram and a half down there. But for mining, we only had 20 or 25 meters of five gram material. So that's what you know people like Nico want to see for their underground stuff. So we've drilled it down to this depth and then we kind of stopped. We said good enough. And the idea is that let's go try to figure out more, a little bit infill on the sides, but let's kind of figure out what's going on on this arc because it's low hanging fruit. So we dropped a lot of holes onto that this year and I expect us to continue following up on that next year. So that's about the gist of uh, the white gold. Thanks, Sean. Great presentation. Um